concern was taken electronic methods we took by a digital signature and the ender uh, processes was documented through uh, video recording so looking at the uh, flow chart uh, i can say that we actually contacted uh, 16472 individuals from all the three clusters and we enrolled 15294 and uh, people who, who took the three doses of the medicine were 11192 so coming to the demographic profile we had uh, 25% almost 26% of the individuals were in the age 6 months to 17 years of age uh, and 64% fall in the adult age group between 18 and 15 and, and elderly were uh, 10% so that you can see that it is ac across the all the three uh, groups in the placebo group in the arsenic number 30 group and 200 groups it was almost similar there was no significant difference between the age distribution uh, in regarding the male and female distribution also it was almost equal number of males and females who participated in the study across all the three uh, clusters so looking at the educational profile we have almost uh, 30 percentage of the people who are having an education which was more than high school uh, there were 21 percentage people Let's, who did, we have yeah. two minutes left two minutes left yeah thank you so 21 uh, percentage were illiterate so the, this was a, a kind of uh, numbers we had got it we had uh, covid 19 suggestive symptoms 36 people out of them 10 people took rt pcr test and two were tested to be positive so coming to the effectiveness uh, this was uh, considered uh, with respect to arsenic and alban 30 as well as as arsenic 200 with respect to placebo the relative risk was 40% so it uh, showed a protective effect of 60% and the 200 potency showed a protective effect of 82% when you look at it, the age different age group it was not significant uh, across uh, 0 to 17 age and 60 above age and above 18 to 15 and we can find that uh, 30 potency had 75% protective effect and 83% uh, in the 200 potency so this was some of the adverse event reporting but this was not related to the drugs but we have captured those details also there were nine participants who reported uh, almost sorry uh, 13 participants who reported some adverse events and conclusion according to our research arsenic and malbon 30 and 200 have a protection rate of 60 and 82 respectively uh, against covid 19 like illnesses this is one of a proof of concept study which uh, actually throws an uh, idea about the efficacy of an homeopathic medicine and further uh, uh, studies has to be done to establish the causal association with laboratory confirmed diagnosis so we have followed good clinical practices uh, and uh, for the medical studies which was carried out for the conduct uh, termination audit reporting and uh, in regarding the uh, human studies Uh, this was implemented and reported in such a manner that there is a public assurance also so thank you for giving this opportunity and i really open now i think now it's open for questions thank you thank you very much alex you finished exactly on time so we have a couple of questions in the uh, the chat um one question is about um uh, asking for a biological um an explanation of the biological mechanism by which homeopathic intervention can prevent infectious disease and the other question is how you knew how how were you sure that the two that the clusters were equally exposed to covid-19 okay thank you for this question uh, uh, this biological possibility was something which had a uh, issue in all of our, all the homeopathic studies because it is very hard to establish because of the super dilution where it goes beyond the avogadro number so literally we cannot find out so that's why we have used the uh, clinical presentations which we, as as a, a proxy indicator for that of course as uh, this now shows that in a larger community trial it works further studies are needed so this is just a proof of concept to start with it i i, I because there was a lack of studies regarding this on a clinical trial basis so our intention was to give one of the uh, very basic evidence thank you 
and regarding how to how to ensure that uh, we made it together it was uh, cluster randomized and we picked up the people from the uh, same socio demographic places in order to prevent the spilling we maintained that uh, it uh, the three clusters are geographically different so that's how we prevented any cluster uh, i mean spilling over the effect ma'am i'm not able to hear you are you yes yeah, sorry um given the the spread of covid-19 since the um since the study um have you any further thoughts has it um changed your mind about um about the efficacy of homeopathic medicine medicines yeah we have seen that uh, this may, there may be many confounders in this which we try to see from our study but the sample size consideration was uh, a limitation that is one of the limitations so we could not find any significant differences what was the effect of other medication previously used we used a washed out period of 3 months but maybe some effects of uh, the local traditions which they usually use in india like when they eat itself they have some spices which may be protective in nature so these things are not really studied or that is yet to be explored and uh, the further now the uh, that time when the study was doing there was no vaccination available now almost uh, around 30% of the population is covered in this tamil nadu state by vaccination so that is yet to see how far and there are many marginalized people and of course you need a boosting so this is not a 100% uh, even vaccinations are not 100% protective so this may be a very a cost effective way to boost your immunity even though you have an vaccination okay, and i think finally it was just to come back on the question about clusters uh they asked that how do you know that the people in the cluster were actually all exposed to covid-19 to the same extent so not just in different geographical locations but how were they actually all exposed to covid-19 to the same extent yeah um, when you look at my, my study area the location geographical location they are not conjoined villages but they are geographically uh, same i mean in the sense that they are having similar kind of makeup and the exposures by location and it is uh, close to the one of the largest metro city in india that is the chennai city so these people are the people who come for work and travel so they are social demographic profile the characteristics are almost similar only some personal or individual characteristics may differ that we have studied uh, but that was not uh, really significant right the uh, frequency of hand washing the way they use the uh, the mask and all those were the only personal things apart from that geographically they were almost comparable that's why we chosen uh, these uh, villages Okay thank you I'm sorry we've run out of time I think there's probably lots of questions that we could have asked thank, thank you. you very much Alex for your thank presentation you so. uh so our next speaker is Alan Ki uh, Alan Krita Alan Krita yes we have Alan here um and Alan Krita is going to be talking about digital transformation in covid-19 era and Alan Krita is from Shahdi University so over to you thank you ma'am is my screen visible to all ma'am is it visible to you yes that's fine if you could just switch on to um yeah the presentation I, yeah thank you a uh, very good morning to one and all before i begin i dr lankrita choudhury along with my co-presenter dr taruna janeja would like to congratulate the organizers of the festival and we are thankful to you for giving us this opportunity we are here to discuss an overview of digital transformation in the covid-19 era a humanitarian catastrophe it entered the human population marked the beginning of the 2020 in the form of a novel virus with the birthplace as china wuhan in march december 31st it was the first case that was identified and by the time anyone could have actually recognized the severity of the condition it became a global spread and march 2020 was declared as the coronavirus pandemic it was a global pandemic bringing the world 
to a closure. It was a complete shutdown all around. The activities, the everything, the human gatherings, interactions, everything came to a closure. Every, and everyone, all of us, like the, and the every sector of the society, probably let it be healthcare, um, healthcare, your uh, e-commerce, your education, industries, anyone, all of us were giving our best to overcome all this deadly virus, this war against the deadly virus. It is, it was, it is still a very bad scenario all around. But humans are trained for one thing. They are trained to extract the best, even from the worst. And the same they did in this COVID time as well. When the, this is the first time in pandemic when, when digital technology has been so much used, it has been so much emphasized on, and it is used on such a massive scale that it has resulted in something called as a digitalization storm. Digital technologies, they have captured the imagination of people. People are allowed to move on their lives using these online modes and they are able to maintain the economic and the education system. And it is the best is that it helped us stay connected all, all this while. Next is that humans have always believed in the survival of the fittest, a theory by Darwin. And it can be very well appreciated through this image I have used. It shows how the humans have evolved from the ape-like ancestors to a very well-dressed civilized men, from the jungles to the beautiful tall buildings, and likewise have evolved our technology. We asked, demanded for the very basic requirement, that is a requirement of a simple website, but we came a long way, a long way that today we are fully we are having a fully advanced technology with having impact on every possible sector of the society. But if we see the last part of the image, it shows, okay, that's enough of change. What is it trying to say? It's saying that every good thing definitely comes for something bad because an excess of use with, of everything, you know, it leads to have some unwanted effects. And so did this technology, which I'll be covering in, as the last part of my presentation. Now, another important thing that we need to know is that digital, it's always digital evolution, not revolution. A lot of us call it as a revolution. It is not at all a revolution because revolution is something which is very radical, but whereas digital evolution is a something that is going on a slow and a gradual pace. It has its own gradual pace and it's growing up slowly, but it is not a new thing that has come up. It is something we have been using centuries back. It was shown by Gottfried in his work three centuries ago. Another thing that people usually confuse themselves with is the ter two terminologies, digitization and digitalization. They are not at all same. We need to understand that digitization is an analog to digital format, whereas digitalization is using the digital technology for interaction, communication, business models, and what all we can think of. So basically, it is the usage of the digital technology. Next, if you can see this slide, it is just trying to represent a roadmap, a roadmap showing how the, the long route that the digital transformation has covered up before reaching today where it is. It started with basically the uh, George Tibbets was the you know, initiator of this digital technology when he introduced the first electromechanical computer and thereafter was the digitalization acceleration. So the, in 1940 was marked as the beginning of digital transformation. Simon was the first personal computer that was introduced in the year 1950, followed by Apple and IBM. 1991, we could find the first 2G net cellular network 1994 was the time when the first pizza order was ordered online. 1996 came up, the most important, the digital currency system. 2008 was the introduction of the Bitcoin. And 2010 was a time when it was marked as the era of digital transformation. 2090s was another, again, very important because it was the explosion of the social media and 2020, we all are so well aware that COVID-19, where digitalization became the matter of survival for many. It is predicted that by 2025, 65% of the spending worldwide of digital technology will expect it to reach around two US dollars. 2 trillion US dollars. 
and the annual growth rate is expected to be around 16.7 percent now coming to my core most important topic that is the core part of my presentation that is digital transformation and innovation the impact of digital transformation can be appreciated in all the sectors of the society but not just today it is way back but during this covid it has gained some special attention and to discuss start with it is let's start talking about the healthcare telemedicine teleconsultation online pharmacies vaccination evidence based medicine it has become so so important these days moving on to education sector schools and colleges they have almost going gone completely online or if the, if it is not online then it is the blended learning for myself only if i talk i am associated with a dental school and thinking about online classes i never i mean i never imagined it and today we i think all of us all of us are so involved with this and we are so now we are feeling so advanced with this online technology we have accepted it so easily and then e-commerce is some then e-commerce which has become the mo again another you know online shopping it is one of the most common things and rather the most fashionable thing nowadays so digital transformation technologies like cloud internet of things blockchain ai has become the bulk of digital transformation now next apart from this there were some who gained you know who were almost on boom during all this uh, covid 19 scenarios especially zoom which was declared as the world leader since global lock lockdown e commerce if we talk amazon has been the big giant and then telemedicine and artificial intelligence they are gaining so much of importance in the healthcare sector now technology in health sector digital health if we talk about it mainly comprises of epidemiological research telemedicine teleconsultation mobile health and ai enabled diagnosis robotics and what all we can think of ai has been so valuable in expediting the development of vaccines predicting why the what all public health measures would be most effective effective and public health how to keep the public updated about the scientific information alan kriti you have two more minutes yeah and then we have geo tagging and all that digital health helps in strengthening the health system it is a tool to link the national and the regional health programs it helps in diet tracking exercising records health applications can minimize the contact between the doctor and the patient which is the main requirement of this present covid situation contact tracing is also another integral part of this digital tra tracing where countries like taiwan they combine the uh, health insurance immigration custom database to generate the real time notification country like my country like india they have come up with a bluetooth tracing app called as the arogya setu and 19.76 crores indians are using this app it played a valuable role in register uh, vaccination in training the healthcare workers online pharmacy is gaining so much of importance and coming to some important facts and the figures 58% countries are using nowadays telemedicine and uk uh, england has from march to may has shifted from tele consultations from 8 lakh to 20 lakhs digital then this is a result of the study which was conducted by myself and my team where we just saw that a title digital shield for our rescue from covid-19 where 631 respondents 58% were well aware of all the technologies that were there whereas 233% were aware of only of the health and the food app so people were get, using this technology to a great extent what is the advantage of this e whole of this digital technology it is easing the workflow digital use of money is there people are, it is going cash paperless and it is effect so much helpful for the environment and an easy flow of money in the market it is leading to so much of societal change people are well able to communicate well they are well connected there are so much of blended learning people are accepting so well there is so much of innovation in the young minds nowadays but every good thing has to come with some challenges so did this digital transformation there is a great issue of digital divide there is cyber security data protection infodemics these are some of the major challenges that still need to be taken care of does technology affect our health surely it does so we have to be careful time now could you just 
sleep to your conclusion yes ma'am sleep problems and emotional disturbances so to end up coming to my conclusion technology is part of our life it can have negative effects but technology will grow massively as an outcome of the digital transformation innovation will be the priority so it's our decision that how we have to use it we have to learn it to use it in a balanced way thank you and it is so much we can talk about it but thank you their house and thank you so much so um we have a few minutes for questions. Does anybody have a question for Alan Krita? Um, so we have a question here. Given the lack of equal access to digital technology and the impact on the digital divide, how can innovation help to address this? Uh, if uh, Thank you for this question. And if we talk about the digital divide, you know, if the, government is you know they're trying their best every country is trying their best to overcome this digital divide so if i talk about my own country like the main uh, apart from the wi-fi infrastructure that is definitely one thing but if we see even the you know the most uh, the person who's belonging to the most low economically who's very very low still they are able to use, afford a mobile phone and they're able to use it and the, the digital divide is can it's just not only about the infrastructure and the wi-fi there are many more issues like the uh, language issues and also they are are trying their best to you know to just overcome it that is still a long way to go we are trying everybody is trying their best to overcome this digital divide but it will take time but then if we see these especially the usage of the mobile phone and all is getting so easy that it will not be very difficult over the period of time to overcome this issue of digital infrastructure and wi-fi i that's what i think so thank you very much um i've got a question um we've done research with older people who um really struggle with um uh with digital access and it's not just about access of of phones and computers it's also about um um education and skills um, for particularly for, for people who are not digital natives. Have you got anything that you wanted to say about that? Sorry, can you unmute mute Alan Krita? Uh, Ma'am, I'm sorry, but can you just please repeat? Your voice was breaking a bit. I could just not take it. Get um, the question. So it's not just about access to equipment. It's also about access to um, skills and education in use of digital um technologies and um, in our experience older people are less comfortable and uh, becoming disenfranchised yes yes this that is the one issue ma'am that we just discussed as a challenge for the digital divide but if we see like they were during all these studies have shown that people have also older age group have also tried, tried you know they have tried to accept this uh, technology they are trying to their best to, to use these social medias whatsapp so i'm gradually i'm sure they will be able to overcome all these hindrances as well with over the period of time thank because, you for your presentation yeah, yeah thank you mom. thank you um so our next presenter i think our next presenter is not here um unless um charles Nasigwa is here. If you are, could you speak up? No, I don't think he's here. Okay, so the next speaker is Gabriella Penn uh, Nasa. And Gabriella is talking about food insecurity in Brazil as a result of the pandemic, challenges and the way forward. Gabriella, would you like to share your screen? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me well? Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Good morning or afternoon. Thank you all for uh, that are here for this session at the festival. I am Gabriela Nasser. I'm a master in global urban health, working with nutrition and health prevention. I am originally from Brazil, but currently I live in Germany, in Freiburg, where I'm pursuing also a PhD in this area. I'm also institutional director of a nonprofit organization in Brazil, which develops programs in nutrition, education, and public health for over 25 years. And my topic today, as uh, was Annie mentioned, is uh, food insecurity in Brazil as a result of the pandemic, challenges and way forward, in which I will talk briefly about how much families in Brazil have been affected by the pandemic in terms of food security, and what are the measures and possibilities to address this in the near future? 
So first, I would like to begin by drawing a rather short perspective on how much Brazil, um, before the onset of the pandemic, was inserted in a scenario of troubling uh, crisis in various sectors. So in the last years, we've had Mm, the country has been facing a, a state of vulnerability due to first a, a slowdown of economic growth in the country, aligned with also a dismantling of several social programs and policies, such as the cash transfer programs that were installed in the early 2000s to alleviate hunger and, uh, and poverty. And this has also accentuated inequalities within the country. And this scenario also affected the food and nutrition agenda, weakening institutional structures and programs that promoted food security, family agriculture, and school meals. And an example of this is the abolishment um, two years ago during this current government of the National Council for, food, for Food and Nutritional Security, which affected several instances within the society, which were strategic for defining policies and programs to combat hunger, food insecurity, and malnutrition among children and the population in general. So before the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, Brazil already had high levels of adult and childhood obesity aligned with conditions such as iron deficiency anemia, characterizing the double burden of malnutrition in the country. Uh, as I said, as I said before, I work in this nonprofit and we carry out BMI, um, uh, we carry out assessments in, in school aged children for our programs. And we found, um, you know, throughout these last years, an average of 27% of school aged children overweight um, or obese. And also, uh, we have levels of anemia as high as 55% among children in some areas of the country. Also in another dimension, and national data from 2018 indicates that uh, 36 percent, around 37 percent of families suffered some level of food insecurity, which was already high. Now, um, the pandemic has had a huge effect not only on the availability and accessibility of food for a large percent of the population, leaving approximately 90 million currently facing hunger again, but also has an effect on family agriculture, uh, for example, which accounts for almost 70% of the national consumption. These small farmers were exposed to poverty and were also not able to sell their products. The National School Meal Program, which provides free meal to approximately 40 million students, was also affected or better yet paused. So this situation aligned with the current political agenda that does not prioritize nutrition, social environmental policies, and family agriculture creates a more unstable environment prone to degradation, hunger, and further deepening of this crisis. This graph corroborates these results, showing an increase in the last years of uh, the state of food insecurity, projecting that in 2020, more than half of the population suffered from some level of food insecurity. Now, uh, the study I'm bringing here was conducted in partnership with this organization, and uh, we developed nutrition education programs in several Brazilian municipalities currently, and we're able to assess the situation within these families directly. Uh, so we used for this the Brazilian scale of food security to assess the current status, and the scale was adapted and validated by Brazilian researchers and institutions in several areas of Brazil. It was adapted by the international use FAO, the American uh, International Scale of Food and Security. And the questionnaire was sent to 2,389 families. Uh, it was conducted both online and also in person with uh, families that are more, uh, which don't have access to, less access to, online tools and four municipalities and two states. Uh, this is the table uh, with the different levels that are considered in the scale. So we have food security when there's regular access and permanent quality food, light, moderate, and severe, which are uh, the severe includes also um, uh, lack of food and insecurity with children uh, and hunger becomes a 
an experience within the household. And the results, I will share some, some of them. 92% um, of the respondents were women, 48% of them not working. 37% had someone in the household who lost their job because of the pandemic and 32 had income reduction. Um, if we look at the uh, food security, more than 65% of the families is suffering some level of food insecurity. This is a striking percentage. If we look at the different levels, 42% is uh, suffers light food insecurity, but 9% is suffering severe. And on an important note is that 26% of the respondent mentioned they suffer from a chronic, chronic condition which demonstrates the deepening effects that poor quality meals can have on the health of this population. So these results demonstrate the urgency to implement long-term behavior change. Um, since uh, there's a risk of developing further complications worsened by inadequate eating habits. Uh, many efforts have been made during this past year uh, in Brazil to alleviate this scenario, as we've seen all, all over, there were distribution of food baskets, for example, throughout the country, not only by social programs, but also each municipality with the uh, money from the national food program, as I mentioned, um, have given food cards to the family or food baskets instead of the money going to the school meal. But that depends a lot on how the municipality is organized. And there's also and it, there needs to be a determined and long-term compromise from the national and local government towards the food and nutrition agenda because this sort of activity is very much um, short-term. So to think in a long-term approach, as I said, challenges and way forward, is necessary to revise the policies and programs towards eradicating poverty and generating employment and income once more. But also with the experience of a work as a civil society organization, it is clear that the government cannot reach all this multi-level approach by itself. So it's necessary the engagement of communities and other local institutions. Uh, civil society organizations have a role to play advocating for policy change. Um, one possible way forward is the promotion of community and home gardens, which also Ricola mentioned, and um, to supply vegetables uh, and instigate children and families to eat healthier. And definitely needs to be more investment once more in attention to small scale farmers and family agriculture programs. So the gap of availability of nutritious fresh food is closed. And I would just like to conclude by saying that overweight and obesity cannot be addressed in isolation. Now more than ever is necessary to develop alternatives that are engaging and multidimensional in order to address all the factors influencing these issues. Uh, with local stakeholder involvement and capacity building of the main players within the communities, it's possible to create um, networks of relationships between schools, health units, local leaders, families, so they can look for alternatives that suits their uh, local needs. And the coming months are crucial and years for governments, institution, and civil society organizations to observe and intervene in order to avoid a possible increase of epidemic proportions on the rates of childhood obesity, undernutrition in children, which uh, can bring you know, even higher death rates due to non-communicable diseases in the future. My uh, reference, to, thank you so much for your attention and I'm available for questions. Thank you very much, Gabriella. You came in under your 10 minutes, fantastic. Um, uh, we have a couple of questions already in the chat. Um, so the first is, what are the negative consequences from Elisa Varga. What are the negative cons consequences of reduced doctor-patient in-person contact? Should we aim for a mixed mo model? And she points out that there was a case in the UK uh, where a seven-year-old died from ke ketoacidosis because he had a physio appointment with his GP who didn't smell the ketones on his breath and was not able to um, recommend appropriate treatment. Is this a particular risk in this situation? Uh, yeah, I'd, 
I think she, she meant for the previous presenter <laughs> because <laughs> it, it's regarding the digital technology, correct, Elisa, if I'm not mistaken? I was, I was also reading it as risks from um, malnutrition. Um, ah, okay, well, uh, yeah, uh, well, addressing this in a general sense, I would say that um, Brazil has a, a, a very large um, in a model uh, actually from the UK of community health agents and a very broad um, uh, primary care service in the communities. And actually these health workers, they go to the, the homes of the families. So, and they detect when there's something wrong and they can um, bring them to the main health post. So there is a bridge at least in theory in Brazil, we know that right now this is not working so much, but. Thank you. Thank you. It was a question just... for the previous speaker. Sorry about that. So um, a question from Jean Pen. Will Brazil get better or worse with the presidential elections coming up in 2022? <laughs> the hope that it gets better. Let's see the results. But um, clearly there needs to be also a support from national policies and local policies in order for for it to improve. And I saw that uh, the question about sampling, uh, Hisham, thank you. I can, I can address that if you don't mind. Uh, any. We actually, this, um, I would say this is a, a limitation of course, when, when we develop studies in partnerships with local institutions, because it's not, I would say, it's not an academic study per se, we just, what we did here was try to get a sense of what is going on. And in this specific, um, uh, this specific study, we just sent out the, the questionnaire to all the families that, from all the schools and the municipalities. So actually it was, it, it was random, the, 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 the answers that we had, uh, but, we, we made it, we, we, we did the study partnerships with the local municipal education uh, departments. So it was sent out to all the schools. Thank you. Just have a minute left for the last question, which is from Ricola. Do you know if there are existing bodies that are partnering to assist with the develop, um, development of the agricultural se se segment along with the government? There are uh, organizations not with the local government. There is not, um, uh, the current government has clearly and openly uh, said that this is not part of the agenda. What is going on for, for, you know, for local farmers is local solutions. And this is probably what's gonna be the, um, you know, the way forward in the next years. Thank you very Thank much. You. A very interesting presentation. Thanks. Um, so our next uh, speaker is Mohammed uh, uh, Ahmed Almadani, but I don't. Sorry, I don't think he's here unless you speak up. Mohammed Ahmadani. I don't think so. Okay, so our next speaker is um, Parvez Harris. I know, I think Parvez has come in and hasn't had a chance to try out uh, your presentation. Um, is Parvez here? Hmm. Ah. Can't see Parvez. P. Harris? Ah, P. Harris, yes. Are you? Well spotted. Mute, yeah. Hello, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Ah, good. Excellent, thank you. So, uh, so, so that uh, one speaker is not there, so I'm, I'm now, yeah? Yes, okay, are you good. able to share your screen? Right, okay, I just go on to share screen and that's it, right? Yes, that's right, and you have uh, 10 minutes. I'll give you a two minute warning. Okay, so I've got 10 minutes. I'll do my best to stay within the, okay. within the allocated time. Uh, can you see the slides? Yes, we can see the slides. And I can do a slideshow now, can't I? Yeah. Slideshow from beginning. OK, thanks very much indeed. Uh, and I'm really happy to be here. And this is an exciting opportunity to 
present uh, some of the uh, analysis I have done and I enjoyed taking part in this uh, uh, meeting. And uh, always I like to start with acknowledgements and uh, the person I like to acknowledge first is my PhD supervisor, he passed away. I wrote his obituary in Trends in Biochemical Sciences and he taught me something that I try to continue to this day. You know, I have many PhD students of myself now, but I still uh, admire him and I've learned a lot from him. And uh, one of the things he always said is always to look out for new techniques, new technologies and new advances. And public health is definitely one area, which is an area that is developing. And although I looked at small molecules and use spectroscopy to look at lipids and so on. So you can see Professor Chapman with uh, Prince Charles is showing him the structure of a phospholipid molecule. So even though I looked at small molecules, I was always keen to look out for new areas of research and public health is one area. And I think it's an important area, but we have to be very careful. And this is a, uh, in the right-hand side, the six blind men and the elephant. And because it's such a, compl a complicated area involving so many different disciplines, it's a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary field, we can easily make mistakes. And I think one of the things that I'm going to be sharing with you today is an area where perhaps if you do not know fully what is going on, we can end up having a sort of like uh, unwanted uh, consequences. So um, one of the things that we have seen in the UK is a huge difference in the death rate uh, in different ethnicities between the Bangladeshis and Pakistanis, for example, compared to all the other ethnicities. So Pakistanis and Bangladeshis uh, saw a huge increase in mortality in the second wave, whereas for all the other ethnicities, it actually decreased. So you know, nothing must have changed in a short amount of time between wave one and wave two. There can't have been change in genetics or housing or, you know, the fact that, you know, uh, um, underlying conditions can't have increased all of a sudden. There must have been some other factor that must have occurred between the first and the second wave that explains why everything, in, uh, the mortality increased for the Bangladeshis and Pakistanis and, and it decreased for everyone else. And my explanation for all this is, that it is the eat out to help out scheme that actually played a pivotal role in increasing the death of these two communities. And I'll explain why, because of the fact that many of the people who are linked to the eat out and help out scheme are actually from Bangladesh and, pa Bangladesh and Pakistani communities. Most of you are here from Manchester, you've been to Winslow Road, I've been there, I've been to Manchester University and you've seen how many restaurants there are and outlets there are, mainly Pakistanis in Manchester. So. Uh, so that what it is, is that if you look at the data from around the world, actually, for almost all the Western European countries and wealthier American states, COVID-19 death rate decreased in the second wave for nearly all of them, apart from some countries that are less developed. Belarus, for example, had a higher death rate in the second wave, but in most countries it decreased, including the UK, it decreased. And I don't want to go into the details of this slide. You can see there is a reference. You can go there and you can find the details. But for uh, quite a number of countries, including the UK, we saw a tenfold decrease in mortality, uh, you know, 9.5 uh, between uh, wave one and wave two. So there was a decrease in mortality. However, the only group that showed an increase in mortality in the UK in the second wave are the Bangladeshis and Pakistanis. So this is an ana anomaly and a, some sort of difference that we don't really know why and has not really been explained as yet. You know, uh, the UK Office of uh, National Statistics published some research, very nice quality work, actually, a lot of data. And this is one of the things we have in the UK. We are lucky. We have a lot of data, uh, data and the ONS has done wonderful work in all of these things. They actually highlighted that the Black community, there was a decrease in mortality. They were the number one in terms of mortality in the first wave, but decreased to, set, to sort of like, you know, 60% reduction in the second wave. But Bangladeshis and Pakistanis, it increased hugely, 165% increase, you know, 200% increase and so on in mortality in the second wave, whereas everyone else, it decreased. Why? That's the question that was not known, that was considered to be alarming, but no explanation provided. So there are lots of different factors that contribute to mortality, huge number of things. Ethnicity related issues include, for example, underlying health conditions such as diabetes, large household, multi-generational families, occupational exposure, structural racism, social vulnerability, social and material deprivation, linguistic and cultural factors. And of course, also things like barriers to accessing public health messaging and so on. So wide range of things that can cause uh, an increase in mortality and which one of these is not so easy to find. So one of the uh, scheme that was introduced in August last year was to help the badly affected hospitality sector and uh, um, uh, uh, Rishi Sunak, the, um, the chancellor introduced a scheme where the food or you know, price of meals when go, people go out and eat, 
50% will be reduced. And this was a great opportunity to help, help the hospitality sector, which badly needed the support. And what it is, is that we've got to realize the hospitality sector, 93% of the claims here, 93% of the claims made uh, were actually by sort of businesses do not have more than you know, one outlet, just single, they're single businesses. So they're mainly small businesses actually. Most of those people who took part, you know, maybe in Wimslow Road, majority of them took part. These are small businesses, of them family run with six, seven, eight people working in sort of very close space, often in very poor ventilated settings and so on. So it makes very difficult, uh, you know, sort of uh, situation for people who might become very busy during a time of the pandemic where the virus is around. So actually Oxford University and Warwick University researchers have already shown that the COVID-19 infection rate increased as a consequence of it out to help out scheme. I'm not going to go into the details of this. I've given references where you can go and find out more about that. But the key point is that they found that there was an increase, probably eight to 17% of all infections during the summer months were attributed to the it out to um, you know, help out scheme. However, one of the things they did not do was the fact that they did not look into the issue of ethnicity and consider occupational exposure in their analysis and so on. Because had they done that, they would have found the answer to which I'm trying to say that I found an answer to. So hopefully, you know, this research will shed light into what is going on. So the summary of the Office of National Statistics data is available in the website. I'm not going to go into the details, but the first wave, the Black Caribbean and the Black Africans had the highest death rate. But in the second wave, you know, they were replaced by the Bangladeshis and Pakistanis. They had some five to 4.1 times greater mortality for the Bangladeshi male and women, male and females compared to white British communities. So why did this happen? Why did it decrease for the blacks and increase for the Bangladeshis and Pakistanis? So this is a bit of analysis I did with the data from the Office of National Statistics. And you can see this is hazard ratio, uh, you know, taking away, uh, subtracting one from the other between wave one and wave two. And if you look at for both males and females, for the Bangladeshis and Pakistanis, th there is a huge, in, uh, you know, sort of like increase in hazard for both the males and the females. So you can see for Bangladeshis and Pakistanis, there is a huge increase, whereas nearly for all the other ethnicities, all of the other ethnicities, including the black groups, there is a huge decrease. So that's quite puzzling. Why did the Bangladeshis and Pakistanis show such an increase whilst others show, uh, showed a decrease? So my explanation for all of this is actually in this slide here, in this slide, more Pakistanis than Bangladeshis work in restaurants and fast food. I don't think it's rocket science to know this. If you go out into any areas in Manchester and other areas, you will see a huge number of food outlets run by Bangladeshis and Pakistanis. Uh, the curry industry is mainly, uh, you know, sort of driven by the Bangladeshi community. So uh, Indian restaurants are owned mainly by the Bangladeshis. Uh, so they, they, they are the largest number of people who work in the sector connected to the eat out to help out. Some 30% work in that sector. Furthermore, about 20% work in the taxi sector. So nearly 50% work in a sector that in one way or another was linked to it, it out to help out because taxis were needed to go to the venues and come back to home from the venues and so on. In contrast, the black community, which show a huge decrease, here I think we could understand that the black community are not engaged with the it out to help out scheme. Most of them work in big organizations such as the health sector, such as public administration and education and so on. So they're in large places with good support. And after the first wave, there were more, more sort of uh, steps taken to protect the workers, including work from home, self-isolation and so on. Such possibilities were not possible for the Bangladeshis and Pakistanis who work in small restaurants, family-run businesses. And so this difference between the death rate of the blacks, commun black communities and the Bangladeshis and Pakistanis is really due to differences in their occupational environment. One group is working in big, huge organizations and others, Bangladeshis and Pakistanis, who are the largest group in terms of self-employed group, they have the most people working in self-employment. They work in small businesses and they can't afford to have good ventilation. They cannot, to do, cannot afford a quarantine and self-isolation and work from home and so on. So they were badly affected and further catalyzed through the eat out help out scheme because they became more busier, more active during that period. And if you look at the occupational differences in risk of deaths, restaurant and catering established management managers have one of the highest. No surprise then that the Bangladeshis and Pakistanis are you know, dying uh, because many of them are in that sector. Chefs, many of the Bangladeshis are chefs and Pakistanis are chefs. So they have a greater risk. Food and drink, small businesses, they're involved in this. This is also a risk. And taxi drivers is another high risk group. You can see here, it's a high risk group. But if you look at the local government and administration and healthcare occupation at the bottom here, where the black population largely work, the risk is much lower. 
and because of the fact that these are huge organizations that have health and safety officers will ensure not only that health and safety advice is given, but they're also implemented. So no one breaks the rule. But in small businesses, family-run businesses, they, cannot, they don't have safety officers and they cannot implement the rules because they're doing it themselves and they don't have all the necessary knowledge to implement the rules and the ventilation system isn't so good. So all in all, occupation is the key driving factor for the difference in ethnicities and so on. And if you look at which sectors benefited most from the it out to help out from this slide. Again, from the Office of National Statistics, you'll see restaurants are the biggest percentage, 55%. No surprise if you go to Winslow Road, you will see that they were very busy during the it out to help out. And here in Leicester, I saw it with my own eyes, parked restaurants, queues outside the restaurants. And, and the, the small businesses, they wanted to make a lot of money. They've been badly affected by the shutdown. So they wanted to make money and the public, they found 50% discount as a great uh, offer and they made the most of it. But unfortunately, this overcrowding and working for long hours in a poorly uh, ventilated place led to increase in uh, right. exposure to the virus. Your time is up. Okay, so can I just finish a couple of, just one, yeah. uh, just one or two slides? Very quickly. Okay, thank you very much indeed. So if you look at this Office of National Statistics, uh, statistics uh, you know, data, you will see that the areas where the uptake was the most in terms of discount and so on, were areas with the high population of ethnic minorities, Bangladeshis and Pakistanis, whether it is Manchester, Gorton area of Man Manchester, Birmingham, Hall Green, Bradford, and then in London, you have Newham, Redbridge, and Enfield. These are all areas with a high percentages of uh, Pakistanis. And I've given the data, the six areas that the Office of National Statistics specifically noted were actually areas with a high percentage of Pakistan, uh, Pakistanis and Bangladeshis. No surprise that it out to help out disproportionately was confined to the, those communities. Um, you know, concerns regarding these uh, queues and overcrowding has been made. Here, for example, Ivan Brown, the you know, Leicester City Director of Public Health, worried about what is so in Leicester. I saw it with on my, on my own eyes. So actually, it out to help out help the Bangladeshi and Pakistani communities in terms of money and finance, but it was a right recipe for a disaster for the Bangladeshis and Pakistani communities because of their overcrowding in their homes. 30% uh, of them work in the sector. They have the highest uh, number of people suffering from diabetes and so on. And the taxis and long, uh, you know, working in taxis and working long hours in, you know, sort of very well, uh, poorly ventilated places. So who is to blame? I mean, I think, you know, it's not a point of blaming uh, this person or that person. I know in the media, uh, there seems to be a rift between Boris Johnson, who was uh, saying that actually it out to help out, you know, help is, spread the coronavirus, whereas Rishi said no. So, so, so what's the conclusion? This is my final slide. This is my final slide. This is just a conclusion. What I like to say is that clear evidence that ethnicity uh, is a factor, but more importantly, in my view, it's not about ethnicity, race, religion, or class. It's about uh, saving human lives and looking for the lowest denominator using data to find out in which area, in which occupations people are most affected and helping them. The reason for the Bangladeshis and Pakistanis having the highest mortality uh, during the second wave is because of the eat out to help out, which accelerated the transmission of virus in the community. And of course, they have lots of underlying condition and so on. So I would say that, you know, COVID-19 is an occupational disease. It started in the NHS and all uh, healthcare workers. And we see uh, its impact during the eat out to help out with restaurant workers and fast food outlet workers. So what am I uh, suggesting? We should learn from the, uh, what has happened and we should provide financial support for improving safety in ventilation in these small businesses who cannot afford to do this. Unlike it was like I'm working in the university, I have the perfect environment for working because health and safety is taken care of by an expert. They cannot do that in small businesses. So what I'm asking for is improving the overall health of workers in small businesses so that we prevent this disease and, uh, and the misery that it brings to so many people in our communities. Thank you for your attention. And I'm sorry for going through it at such a uh, quick pace. Thank you very much, Pabazan. Unfortunately, you've used up all your question and answer time. So I'm just going to ask if you can answer the questions that are in the chat, if you could just- Sure, sure. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much Thanks indeed, very much. Annie. So the next speaker is Hitchim. I know that Hitchim, you've had a lot of, oh, sorry. You've had a lot of problems with your internet connection, but hopefully you'll be able to um, do your presentation. Um, yeah, are you there Hitchim? Hi Hitchim, are you there? Yeah, he's still on the call. I think he's gone. Ah, uh, he's just. Okay, he's just gone. Then I just saw. 
Yeah. See if you're going to come back in. Okay, I'm going to just give him a couple of minutes because he's been in and out very regularly. So um, in while we're waiting, if you could, um, everybody could fill in the, um, the voting forms. I'm going to put the... Um, I'm going to put the link in the chat again so that you have it right in oh, right in front of you. Um, so there will be um, prizes for the best presentation and, um, and those prizes are awarded based on the votes from people who've been listening to the presentation. So um, the voting form is there. Please fill it in for this, um, this oral presentation session. So I'm just going to have a look. I don't think that Richard has got back in, which is a real shame because... He's been really trying to get in and we did speak to him right at the start. Um, if possible, we'll try and slot him in somewhere else. Um, I think we've already had to do that once though. Okay, so I'd just like to say a big thank you to everybody who's presented. Absolutely fantastic presentations. I think everybody will agree. It's a shame that we can't give you some applause. And if we were in in person, I'm sure there would have been a lot of applause for all of those presentations. Um, thank you very much for um, for uh, submitting your presentations. Thank you for delivering them so well. And um, hopefully, we will see you at some of the other sessions during the um, the uh, the International Festival of Public Health. So, thank you very much. I can see that Harvis is still typing. So, if you have a, a question that he is I'm just trying to answer some of the questions because it's exciting and yeah. <laughs> sorry about this. <laughs> uh, I, I wish, you know, I mean, I wish, um, you know, everything, you know, because you have some speakers uh, not turning out. If, of course, you can't be unfair to those people who already did their presentation and give, give those who came later more time. But one of That's the things right. that could have been done is use some of the remaining time for, you know, Q&A and panel discussions and whatever but I mean you know it's uh, it's difficult I understand <laughs> okay well um and don't forget that the um the sessions are being recorded so if you've missed any of the um sessions from the festival you can go onto the website and um check out um presentations afterwards okay thank you very much I think we'll close now <laughs>